what's up everyone and welcome to an episode of danny b speaks the podcast girl you know what podcast is taking a break this week and i promised that there would be an episode released on wednesday so i went ahead and just got up off my butt and decided to finally finish editing this podcast that i have been wanting to put out for a while so here we are Girl, you know what podcast will be back next week. So in the meantime, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Now, usually for October, when I am on a consistent schedule, I guess we could say, every October, I try to bring at least one or two stories, like haunted stories that involve the Columbus, Central Ohio area. And I haven't been able to do that yet. So hopefully, hopefully this won't be the first year that I skip that, but... I don't want to wait till next year, but I'll just include it in an episode, you know, and say that this was the haunted episode or whatever. But that's neither here nor there. You know, we cover everything on this here podcast and there's always room for reinvention, but more on that another time. So welcome to Danny B Speaks the podcast. I may have disappeared on this one and the True Crime with Danny B Speaks podcast, but you can catch me pretty much every week on Girl You Know What podcast that I co-host with my friend Keisha. And as I mentioned, we're just taking a break this week. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. But I truly wanted to get back to basics and what I originally started doing, which is my podcast, Danny B Speaks the podcast. I'm still toying around with the idea of retiring the Danny B Speaks name but I, it's tied to too much. So that's something that I'll discuss on another episode when I talk about my growth and things like that that have been going on. But anyway, I have so many plans for this show. Just want to take it like in a not a different direction, but I want to I think I mentioned this before where I want to be able to discuss things that not only are important to me, but things that I talk about with my friends and, you know, people that I'm close with. Just, you know, it's always about conversation. That's what I like. I like starting the conversation and keeping it going. But I think that this episode right here is something that I also want to get into. And I think you're going to enjoy this episode. For me, I love all things history. I do. I love shade and I love to tell a story. And this one right here definitely encompasses all of that. So I think you're all going to like this one. Here we go. Recently, I was listening to a podcast called Think Twice Michael Jackson. They covered things he went through personally as well as legally throughout his life and career. And a lot of it was like a deep dive into the person that, you know, why he possibly became the person that he was you know, why he acted the way he did, why he was so guarded. It really, it really was a good podcast. And it's called Think Twice Michael Jackson. I can't remember who it was brought by, but that was the name of the podcast. So anyway, there was a particular episode on this podcast that focused on Michael's infamous 1993 Super Bowl halftime performance. I didn't realize up until that point that the halftime show for the Super Bowl was extremely family friendly. And can we say maybe Maybe cheesy, corny, boring, if you will. You know what I mean? I looked at some of the old clips of them. And I mean, I'm talking about like ice capades and, you know, color guards. And I mean, it was it was weird. You know, it was just like what you think that it is now with the Super Bowl halftime show has turned into in recent years. Michael Jackson was the first person that performed in that capacity, like had a mini concert at the Super Bowl. And I didn't realize that. And then my question was... Why did the Super Bowl, which is sports biggest night, take interest in having some of the biggest entertainers take over their halftime show? Well, let me tell you, we can thank the legendary Fox Network comedy skit show in Living Color for that. So for my younger listeners or people who just may not have been into that type of show growing up, In Living Color was a comedy skit show that ran on Fox from 1990 to 1994. It was the brainchild of Keenan Ivory Wayans of the, leg- of the legendary Wayans family who are comedic legends. I mean, let's just call it what it is. So not only did this show star his siblings, Damon, Kim, Sean, and Marlon, but it also introduced us to some other comedic geniuses that you may have heard of, like Jim Carrey, Tommy Davidson, David Alan Greer, Jamie Foxx, Kim Coles. I mean, that's just to name a few. You know what I mean? So now, 
During the intro and commercial breaks, we were always blessed with the moves of the Rosie Perez-led and choreographed Fly Girls, which included Jennifer Lopez, Carrie Nanaba, and Josie Harris, just to name a few who went on to have bigger careers, you know, outside of the Fly Girls. So, so how did this half-hour sketch show influence the way that the NFL would change the Super Bowl halftime show to what it has become today? So let's just break this down real quick. In 1992, during Super Bowl 26 between the Washington Now Commanders versus the Buffalo Bills, the Super Bowl was airing on CBS and they decided to promote the 1992 Winter Olympics, which would be kicking off real soon. So the NFL decided to title this halftime show Winter Magic, which was basically just an ice skating show. And there you have it. I mean, that's pretty much what it, what it was, Courtney. OK, I mean, if you're into ice skating, that's fine. I do like watching it sometimes, but I used to like watching it more back in the day. Now I'm just like, eh, OK, whatever. But that's besides the point. So Enter in Living Color, which was already a very popular show. It also aired on Sunday night, the night of the Super Bowl. Usually, and even still today, like when the Super Bowl is on, when the Oscars, the Grammys, when like big events like that are on, usually TV shows, they take a week off. They'll take a break. You know, they won't air because they don't want to be in competition with the biggest sports night or the biggest night in music or whatever. Now, we may remember that during the regular shows when The Living Color was airing, there were always musical guests to close out the show. It was usually a hip hop artist were the ones that were featured. And, you know, of course, I was all here for that, especially 90s hip hop. Let's go. So this year on Super Bowl Sunday, during the most watched show of the year, In Living Color decided to air a live football themed show, which was episode 16 of their third season. If you ever want to look that up. First of all, in Living Color shows were always pre-taped. I don't believe they ever aired a live show until this day. I could be wrong, but I think that most of the shows were pre-taped. And they were in front of a live studio audience. We all saw that. So, but I believe that most of the shows were pre-taped. Like I said, I could be wrong, but anyway. Not only that, they aired a live show. They aired the show specifically during halftime of the Super Bowl. And Living Color star Tommy Davidson said, we knew that we could give a better show. And that's exactly what they did. I mean, I watched the episode and it went, it was, it was good. I don't, I mean, I, I'm sure I watched it over the Super Bowl halftime show, you know, back then, because I watched like every episode of In Living Color. I had to be in front of my TV Sunday nights, you know, Sunday nights on Fox was the jam in the early 90s. And this particular show drew over 28.9 million viewers, many of whom switched over from the game, which I'm sure we did, during halftime to watch this special episode of In Living Color. I mean, there was comedy, music, dancing. I mean, real entertainment that people wanted to see. You know, we were going into, we were in the 90s. You know, there was colorful, you know, people didn't want, I mean, if you wanted to watch ice skating, the Olympics were getting ready to come on. You know what I'm saying? So there's that. But you better believe that the NFL definitely took notice of this. And I'm sure they were like, oh, hell no. They lost 28.9 million viewers for their halftime show. Just think about if that happened today, which we know it won't because they purposely get. I mean, some people just turn on the Super Bowl just for the halftime show, you know, because the commercials, let's keep it real. The commercials haven't been that great lately, but the halftime show is usually what people are going to tune in for. Just like this year is going to be Usher. Usher has been putting on a damn show in Vegas. I mean, he's been, I mean, he has the best show in Vegas in years. Let's just keep it real. Yeah, he's going to be on the show this year. So even if people aren't watching the halftime, I mean, if if they're not watching the Super Bowl, they're going to watch the halftime show. I mean, let's just keep it real. And you know what? Let's keep it real. As good as it turned out for In Living Color, they took a chance themselves. Yes, they had the backing of their network and they were even sponsored by Frito-Lay, you know, who or Frito-Lay's whatever, who were the ones that actually came up with the idea to counter program against the Super Bowl, which is shady as hell, but funny. So, of course, 
Keenan Ivory Wayans was definitely here for it. Now, even with their backing, Fox and Frito Lay were there. They were slightly nervous. Let's just say that they were slightly nervous and not necessarily for the views because they pretty much figured that they could get some views, especially finding out what the halftime show of the Super Bowl was going to be. Let's just say that they were more nervous because in living color was very edgy. They got away with a lot of stuff because, you know, the early 90s, people weren't as delicate and sensitive as they are now and living color was that show and they pushed the line numerous times I mean some of the skits that they have on there today even Blaine and Antoine I guarantee the LGBTQIA community would be not here for it and not all of them we know the ones the ones that just like to fuss but anyway and I say that because in living color they pushed the envelope with pretty much every skit that they did it didn't matter what it was. They pushed the limit. They countered and produced and protrude every single stereotype that you could put out there. But it was all so true. It was just genius. So for anyone who's never watched In Living Color, especially like I know I have a lot of younger listeners, find it. Find at least a few clips of In Living Color to watch it and I'm I'm sure it's available on D I think I actually have the DVD set collection. I got so many DVDs that are put up that, you know, I'm not getting rid of. But yeah. So anyway. So of course that's why Frito Lays and Fox were a little nervous about what was going to happen. I mean, one slip up and fines will be coming in. I mean, we know how that goes. You know, when stuff happens, we know how it goes. So the network ended up settling for a five to 10 second delay to try to catch something before it aired, but everything went smooth. There were no glitches, no slip ups, no fines were needed, nothing. The show went on flawlessly, which not only just proved so much, but it also proved what a black even yeah I mean Jim Carrey was on there and I I can't think of the white lady's name that was on there for a long time I'm sorry but there was a white female comedian that was on there for years and um, was her name Kelly or something but anyway I see her face of course but I can't think of her name right now off the top of my head but it was a black run predominantly starred comedy show which had not happened in years you know since like Richard Pryor and Flip Wilson I mean this is like in recent years where this happened and It was a new time, a family that a lot of people really hadn't heard of until this show came on the air. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the NFL definitely took notice. They didn't want that to happen ever again. They wanted to entertain everyone from the national anthem, the commercials, the halftime show, And yeah, of course, the actual game. I mean, that's what, you know, most people you would think are there for. But, you know, we know some people for years just watch for the commercials. Some people just watch, as I mentioned, you know, for the halftime show. But, you know, we're actually there for the game. But it's it's a huge entertainment thing. So they wanted people to be in tune the entire, what? three and a half, four hours that the Super Bowl is going on. So in 1993, they knew they had to go big. I mean, it was just like they couldn't just do some little show, you know, that nobody was going to want to see. They had to take what In Living Color did in a sense and transform that into their halftime show. Now, of course, it wouldn't be any comedy or anything like that. They were focused on a musical guest. They couldn't do what In Living Color did. They weren't trying to do that, but they were trying to do something that would bring in those ratings. That's basically what it was. I mean, they really had no choice. Let's just keep it real. So they ended up booking Michael Jackson as the halftime entertainment for Super Bowl 27. I mean, to get MJ, they were not playing. I mean, in 1993, early 1993, Okay, Michael Jackson was at the epitome of his career. Later on in the year, things kind of got a little rocky for him. But up until that point, Michael was that dude. There was no, like nobody was touching Michael Jackson. He hadn't released another quote unquote thriller album, but what was the album after Thriller? Dangerous? That's the album that was out at that time. And he was, I mean, after Thriller, it was bad than Dangerous. And I mean, he still was selling out record, selling records and selling, you know, I mean, his, he was, I believe, the first musical artist to do like big, he would call them mini movies. They weren't videos. I mean, he was shut down networks to premiere his music videos. And they would be like almost a half hour long, you know, like at least 20 minutes long. 
So that's what they were going for, and they got it. Michael agreed to do the show, went off, of course, flawlessly, and their ratings went back up. You know, even though In Living Color, you know, still aired that same year on the same day on Super Bowl Sunday, they still did big numbers. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah. But anyway, now for years, the cast of In Living Color always stated how they influenced the Super Bowl halftime shows. And of course, the NFL won't ever admit to it, but they did. I mean, let's just, you know. I mean, they had the NFL spooked. Let's just keep it real. They did. You know, I mean, for them to, you know, think they had it nipped in the bud with these little, you know, flower child uh, halftime shows or whatever. Mm -mm, No. And you see what they had to do. So I know for a fact that coming from Fox, because Fox was still kind of a new network at the time. And they were still kind of, you know, like everybody says, that Fox basically built their network off of black shows, which they did. There were a lot of black shows on Fox in the early to mid 90s. And of course, now you don't really see that. But I mean, even the NFL airs on Fox now. So that's how big Fox is that, you know, how big they have become. So but NFL was spooked. Let's just keep it real. So and you know, I mean, they thought that they had something going on, you know, with their little pomp and circumstance type shows that absolutely no one was feeling in the 90s. I mean, you know, and they let it be known. I mean, it, it is what it is. So now, also for the 1993 Super Bowl, which is something that also it, that isn't talked about, I should say, CBS lost the television rights to the game and it ended up moving right on over to NBC. Now, some people are saying that it's because of what Fox and In Living Color did to them to make them lose that many, to lose in the ratings basically to a half hour comedy skit show. But of course the NFL won't, they, you know, they'll probably say something like their contract ran out or whatever, you know, some BS. So <laughs> I think it's funny though. I mean, look, I love it. You know, being a student of comedy and Living Color was always and still is one of my favorite shows. I mean, In Living Color skit show wise, For me, it's in Living Color, Mad TV, and then Saturday Night Live. You know, Saturday Night Live is a staple, but I mean, I can even go back as far as I've seen, you know, the Flip Wilson show. I've seen the Richard Pryor show or Richard Pryor Comedy Hour, whatever it was called. Um, I believe that's what it was called. I don't mean that with any disrespect. I just can't think right off the top of my head right now what the show is exactly called. But they had skit shows back in the 70s. And yeah, I mean, even shows like Laugh-In, you know, Hee Haw, you know, even though I remember watching reruns of those. I think it came they came on like at Nickelode- on Nickelodeon or something like when I was a kid. And I thought those were funny. But to see a show like that just demolish the NFL was just funny to me you know it was just like I loved it for me like growing up I couldn't wait until Sunday evenings when it would air I mean and Living Color was just that show so to find out that they had another place in history that made me very happy I was very happy to read about this and to find out about I'm glad I listened to that episode because I had heard that before that in Living Color did sort of you know, not sort of, but did influence the NFL Super Bowl halftime show, but I never like really took a deep dive into it. You know, I was just like, oh, I'm sure they did, you know, whatever. But I didn't, like I said earlier in the show, I didn't know that there weren't any like major music artists that performed, that didn't perform during the halftime show. I didn't know that Michael Jackson was the first one to do it. I was what, like maybe 13 at the time, 13, 14 years old when Michael Jackson performed. That's all I remember is Michael Jackson performing. I didn't know he was the first. I, I had no idea. But yeah, so, you know, I'm here I'm, you know, I should say I'm always here for an old nasty piece of history lesson. I love it. And these I really enjoy. A black led show did this completely changed the game. Literally just completely changed the game. I love it. So thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Danny B Speaks, the podcast. Be sure to check out my other solo podcast, True Crime with Danny B Speaks, where, of course, I discuss one of my favorite things, which is true crime. I also have a third podcast, which is a collaboration with my good friend Keisha of Wellness and Women and The Pink Box. That podcast is called Girl You Know What. You can check us out over on IG at girl underscore you know what if you have any questions, suggestions, um, if you would like to be featured 
featured on the show. You have to have like some kind of, well, we'll I'll get into that on the podcast. And, you know, we'll get into that. So you have to listen to it to find out how you can be on that podcast. There you go. You can listen to all three podcasts on my website, dannybspeaks.com, on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, Audible, Spotify, and my YouTube page, which is Danny B Speaks. Also on my YouTube page, you can enjoy nostalgic videos, reviews, music mashups, and other original content. More which will be coming very soon, I promise. I'm, I'm dead serious. I promise they're coming. So be sure to subscribe to my YouTube page at Danny B Speaks and get into all that. You can follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Danny B Speaks. If you have Apple Music and want to listen to some good playlists, follow me on Apple Music where I share playlists that I have created myself. Some are even back from like my DJing days. Like I'm telling you, like back in the day, like I found some playlists that I did back when I used to DJ and it's really some good stuff on there. I'm just saying. But anyway, on Apple Music, I am under Tahir Ali. So go ahead and give me a follow and a listen over there. If you need to reach out to me for any business inquiries, such as promoting your business, your products, et cetera, anything like that on my podcast, on my website, on my social media platforms, or if you want to discuss collaborating with me, sponsoring me, being a guest on the show, you can go ahead and hit me up at dannybspeaks at gmail.com. As always, I truly appreciate you all. Be sure to continue to support or start supporting the Danny B Speaks brand. It would be so greatly appreciated. One day I'll get consistent, but just bear with me until then. You know, baby girl got a full-time job. I'm helping raise some kids. It's, It's a lot going on. So anyway, until next time, take care of yourselves and each other. Be safe out there, and I will catch you all on the next one. Peace.